Yeah, thanks, Les. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, delight to be in your beautiful city and state. Uh, boy, we're, we're enjoying the warm temperatures that don't feel as warm. Uh, amazing, actually. What are we in the 90s? But I've been sitting outside <clears throat> in a lawn chair outside my hotel room, tanning a little more, and just enjoying <laughs> the outdoors and felt so pleasant, especially in the evening. My wife is a great lover of mountains. And when I spoke to her this morning, I said, where are you? You sound like you're in the car. And she said, yeah, I'm just driving up to the mountains to do some sightseeing. So I don't know where she was going. There are none in Atlanta. So she was driving probably to the Carolinas or something. I said, I'm just sitting outside my hotel room here looking at them so we can connect some way through rocks and stones across the miles. Uh, I've been asked to speak on uh, the issue of life's questions. It's very generic. In other words, I can start with that subject and end up with mine, or I can start up with mine and end up with that. Uh, tomorrow night at Grand Canyon University, we've got the very specific one on where is God, which of course is one of the hardest questions on apologetics to really uh, try to deal with. Apologetics as a discipline, it's the word coming from the Greek word apologia, which literally means to give an answer to. The Apostle Peter says, always be prepared to give an apologia to anyone who asks of you, and to do so with, uh, with gentleness and, and with, a, with a meek spirit. The Apostle Peter at Pentecost, when everybody was confounded with what was happening, he said, let me stand up and give you an apologia, an apologetic, an explanation of what is happening. The prophet Joel, uh, when the prophet Joel is referred to, he says, this was that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So apologetics, as I understand it in my own thinking, really has two responsibilities. Number one, it gives answers to the hard and the soft questions. A question like tomorrow night is a hard question. By that I do not mean hard as implying difficult, but it's a, it's a laser pointed sharp question. You're trying to find an explanation for the existence of God when there seem to be so many other contrary indications to that. How do you explain where God is in all of this? That's what the apologists will call a hard question. It's a pointed question. Today is much more like a soft one, where you're dealing with the contexts of issues and trying to give yourself a paradigm from the framework of which the hard questions can be answered. Because to every text, there has to be a context, otherwise it ends up becoming a pretext. You just use uh, ideas in order to sort of uh, satisfy your own uh, comfort zone. That is not what apologetics is all about. Apologetics is actually trying to get the listener into the comfort zone with the answers by clarifying truth claims and giving responses to hard questions. You know, the story is told of a couple of guys who were sitting around a restaurant and one fellow said to the other, he said, um, let's have a bet. I will ask myself a question and if I answer it, you buy me a Coke. <laughs> the fellow says, what's that? He said, no, no, I'll ask myself a question. If I answer it, you buy me a Coke. The other says, what's the big deal about this? He said, no, no, then you ask yourself a question and you answer it and I'll buy you a Coke. We'll keep going this way till one of us asks ourselves a question we cannot answer. <laughs> well, I said, this is the strangest kind of bet I've ever heard. He said, oh, it'll be very, very simple, actually. So since I proposed it, why don't I start? He said, my question to me is this. How does a rabbit burrow a hole into the ground without throwing mud onto the outside? How does it burrow a hole into the ground without throwing mud onto the outside? He said, my answer is, it should start digging from the inside. The other guy said, how can it do that? He said, I don't know, that's your question. <laughs> Many years ago, there used to be a prominent commercial on television, and it would come up with, what's the age of the Earth? You know, how many thousands of miles to this planet or that planet? Tough hard questions and then it would get into softer ones like do you like pizza you know what is your favorite color and then the screen went black and some kind of new age music 
and a motorbike came onto the middle of the screen and it just said this, Yamaha. <laughs> it may not be the answer, but at least it's not another question. <laughs> Questions galore. Have you heard this one? Sam, can you tell me the parable of the Good Samaritan on your ordination exam here? Yes, sir, I will, sir. Once there was this man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked him. And as he went on, he didn't have no money, and he met the queen of Sheba, and she gave him a thousand talents of gold and a thousand changes of raiment. And he got into a chariot and drove furiously. And when he was driving under a big juniper tree, his hair got caught on the limb of that tree, and he hung there many days. And the ravens brought him food to eat and water to drink, and he ate 5,000 loaves of bread and two fishes. One night when he was hanging there asleep, his wife Delilah come along and cut off his hair. And he dropped and fell on stony ground. But he got up and went on and it began to rain and it rained 40 days and 40 nights. And he hid himself in a cave and he lived on locusts and wild honey. Then he went on till he met a servant who said, come take supper at my house. And he made an excuse and said, no, I won't. I married a wife and I can't go. And the servant went down to the highways and the hedges and compelled him to come in. After supper, he went on and come on down to Jericho. When he got there, he looked up and saw that old queen Jezebel sitting down way up high in a window. And she laughed at him. And he said, throw her down out there. And they threw her down out there. And he said, throw her down again. And they threw her down again, 70 times 7. <laughs> <laughs> and of the fragments they remained, they picked up 12 baskets full besides women and children. <laughs> and they say, blessed are the peacemakers, P-I-E-C-E. -E. <laughs> now, whose wife do you think she will be on that judgment day? That's brilliant. Great story, wrong context. And you know what? I think the day is going to come when people won't even laugh at that story because they won't know what's so funny about it. They will not know enough of the biblical narrative in order to see the messed up context of what this creative genius has done. What I want to do tonight is give you a context from which the Bible gives us its answers. These are the foundations which keep the infrastructure of the biblical worldview standing. They are foundational thoughts. It is critical we understand that on these pillars are the, are the ideational strength, is the ideational strength of what the biblical worldview is all about. Some years ago, I was speaking at Ohio State University, and my host was driving me past a building. And as I was driving past, he looked at me at the building next to, to me, to us, and he said, this is America's first postmodern building, the Wexner Center of the Arts. I said, I know what postmodern philosophy is. I know what it is in literature. What on earth is a postmodern building? He said, well, the architect felt since life itself doesn't have any purpose and design, why should our buildings have any purpose and design? So he designed this building with no particular purpose in mind. There are staircases that go nowhere. There are rooms that have no particular usefulness. And there are ceilings that are so low at some point you don't even want to call it a room. And he went on to describe it. He said, what do you think? I said, did he do the same thing with the foundation as well? <laughs> you know, you can't mess with the foundation. City Hall knows at least that much. You can't mess with the foundation of a building, no matter how artistic your propensities actually are. And when you're establishing a worldview, no matter how you make your decisions on the moment as they come up before you, there is a substructure under which those decisions actually are made. You make them having committed yourself to greater ideas that you've already committed your conscience to. That then provides the context for you to make your decisions when options come up along your way. You don't just suddenly say, should I cheat on my taxes or not? You have already established whether you are going to be pragmatic in what you do or whether you're going to have a value structure that will address and inform all of your decisions. 
when uh, Robert Shapiro, after the O.J. Simpson trial and some time had gone by, Larry King had him on, he was the head of the, uh, the, the, the legal team. And he looked at Robert Shapiro, who's a friend of his, and he said, Bob, what do you think happened that night? What is the truth about what happened that night then, when these two people were murdered? He said, Bob, I don't deal with the truth. He said, I am an attorney challenged with the task of defending my client. And he said, but what do you think actually happened then? He said, don't you understand, Larry? I make professional judgments. I do not make moral judgments. Did it occur to Mr. Shapiro that in choosing to be professional rather than moral, he had already made a moral judgment? The backdrop was already made that the pragmatism of the moment was going to dictate how he operated with the evidence or the lack of it. Morality and truth, incidentally, had nothing to do with his job. Fearsome, isn't it? That's why one philosopher of ethics said, ours is an age where ethics has become obsolete. It is superseded by science, deleted by psychology, and dismissed as emotive by philosophy. It is drowned in compassion, evaporates into aesthetics, and retreats before relativism. The usual moral distinctions between good and bad are simply drowned in a maudlin emotion in which we feel more sympathy for the murderer than the murdered, for the adulterer than for the betrayed, and in which we have actually begun to believe that the real guilty party is the one who uh, is the victim and not the perpetrator of the crime. The real guilty party, the one who somehow caused it all, is the victim and not the perpetrator of the crime. About three weeks ago, I was in Jakarta, Indonesia, doing a talk forum with another Islamic scholar, and one of the hosts had discussed an issue that had taken place the previous week, where a woman had been raped in Jakarta, or some part of Indonesia, and um, a, a, a member of the political bureau in a, in a strong religiously oriented worldview said, what else do you expect? The woman ought to take the blame for the way she dressed. The woman was on the platform and literally just clasped her head and she said, what on earth are we coming to? But the one who somehow caused it all is the victim and not the perpetrator of the crime. We make professional judgments, not moral judgments. I want to talk to you about the kind of con the context that the Bible gives to you and me on the basis of which we must make our judgments. Number one, the Bible tells us we must look to the dimension of eternity. We make our decisions and our judgments not on the basis of the temporal, but on the basis of the eternal. If you take the dimension of eternity away, think of two or three things and the hollowness of them as a result. If there's no, inter if there's no eternal perspective, think of two or three things alone and see how meaningless life becomes. Think of the dimension of love. What happens to love? What happens to the relationships you have so cherished and enjoyed? Recently, my wife and I heard about a week ago of a friend of ours whose two-year-old child has been stricken with cancer. Two years old. How does a parent handle that? How does a parent deal with this? And if love is purely a time plus matter plus chance, a biological product, you know, people like Richard Dawkins and all audaciously attack theism. They mock it. They are brilliant in their language and science and all of that. They leave the biggest questions of life unanswered. The biggest questions of life are unanswered. What happens to love if there's no eternal perspective? What happens to justice? Where do you turn for an ontic referent to the, to the issues of justice? What do you make of a Hitler or a Stalin if all they ended up doing was at their whim and at their desire? One eliminated 15 million of his own people. The other millions and millions and plunged, plunged this 
whole world into a kind of a holocaust and then ended up by snuffing out his own life. Is that all there is to it? I'll never forget when I arrived in Canada. I was only 20. And there they were in 1968 giving to the world a glimpse of something the human eye had never seen. I was looking at my television screen on Christmas night with my parents, my brothers and sisters, we'd all now come together in this, in our little town home in Toronto. We were watching what was going to be given to the American astronauts, which was vouchsafed to them the first time ever vouchsafed to a human eye. As they went around the dark side of the moon and watched the earth rise over the horizon of the moon, draped in a beauteous mixture of blue and white, garlanded by the glistening light of the sun against the black void of space. Nothing in their minds prepared them for the awesomeness of the moment. And the astronaut with no rehearsal in mind, no poet in mind, no lyricist in mind, no philosopher in mind, the only words that sprung out of the depths of his soul were the beginning words of the Bible, in the beginning God. In the beginning God. No science textbook or primordial slime could explain that for the moment. It was only the vastness and the intelligibility of a great designer. In the beginning, God. The whole dimension of eternity is wrapped up in that first uncaused, uncreated, absolute being who is above time, for whom there is no beginning or no end. Think of how you and I also relate to this question of time. We react to things that are common as if they are surprises. I, I'm indebted to C.S. Lewis for this idea. Lewis, for example, makes the common. We look at a young man and say, my, how he's grown. Or my, how time flies. My son Nathan, who's bigger than I am now, when he was about 12 or 13, he said, Dad, everywhere you take me, I'm getting tired of people saying to me, my, how he's grown. He said, don't you think they ought to be surprised if I didn't? <laughs> ought not they, they say, my, what's the matter with the boy? He's not growing. My, how he's grown. My, how time flies. You know, here I am now, we are all at the tail end of 2011. When I was a little kid, I used to wait for Christmas, for summer holidays all the time because I hated school and I loved the vacation. And it was a cumbersome, monotonous, boring nine months till the summer vacation would arrive. Now I find at this stage in life, those days come quicker and quicker and quicker. And if you look at my itinerary one year ahead at a time where we are planning our flights three to four months ahead at a time, you just watch time whiz by, and it's almost folly to say, my how time flies. My how he's grown, my how time flies. Lewis says this, it would be as ridiculous at a fish, as a fish constantly expressing its surprise at the wetness of water. <laughs> Unless, of course, he says, it was intended one day to live on dry land. Get the point? Be as ridiculous as a fish being surprised at the wetness of water, unless, of course, it were intended one day to live on dry land. May I suggest to you, it's this haunting reality of eternity that peers out of your eyes when you see the enormity and intelligibility of this universe, or when you recognize the surprising speed at which time actually goes, and then you say to yourself, maybe I'm really designed for eternity. That's why the surprising movement of time catches me off guard always. It is also Lewis in his book on heaven, he says this, in speaking of this desire for our own far off country which we find in ourselves even now, I feel a certain shyness in me. I'm always committing an indecency. I'm trying to rip open the inconsolable secret in every one of you, the secret which hurts so much that you take your revenge on it by calling it names like nostalgia and romanticism and adolescence, the secret also which pierces with such sweetness 
that in very intimate conversation the mention of heaven becomes imminent. We grow awkward and affect to laugh at ourselves. The secret we cannot hide but we cannot tell, though we desire to do both. We cannot tell it because it is a desire for something that has never actually happened or appeared in our experience. We cannot hide it because our experience is constantly suggesting it and we betray ourselves like lovers at the mention of the name heaven. My father-in-law, Lindsay Reynolds, is one of the finest gentlemen I'd ever known. Taught me so much of what I knew in, in just the graciousness with which he treated people. And he passed away about uh, six years ago, uh, suddenly contracted cancer, he was 85 years old. He was a hardcore empiricist, he was a chemical engineer. If you said anything to him, he always wanted proof for it, always. But he's a dedicated Christian. But now when he was stricken with cancer, his faith was for the first time really put to the test. He was a World War II veteran, gone through a lot in the Royal Canadian Air Force and so on. And when he was given that news, he began to struggle and struggle and struggle. He battled it out. I would sit with him across a donut and coffee and talk to him that his life had been spent for God. He'd raised four beautiful girls and been a terrific husband and father and all, nothing was really working. And he asked just to pray that somehow he would have a few extended days so he could get his house in order. The man was so meticulously organized anyway, if he saw my desk, he'd have kittens over the whole thing. But he was quite so thoroughly organized, and yet he was worried he wasn't. Finally, the days were coming in closer and closer and closer to an end. I was away from Toronto at that time. My wife had flown in there with her sisters, and they were standing around the bed. For about two, three days, he'd said nothing. He'd gone into silence, shrunken down to a bag of bones. My, my wife said it was just so hard to see dad like that, pitiful. And then, as his wife and daughters were there, I was drawn about, I wasn't gonna make it before that last minute came. She said, he opened his eyes for one last time. He looked to the ceiling and he said these words, that's amazing, just amazing. And then he looked at his wife of 60 some years and said, Jean, I love you. He was gone. The two most eternally fulfilling things, that death is not the end and that love can triumph through it all he clung to in the last minute and died the way he lived as a Christian gentleman. The eternal perspective, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. I don't know how many times I've been asked one question, if it's at all in your mind, please don't ask it of me. What will you say when you just for the first time see God? I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> what I'd be afraid of is what he's going to say to me. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? What are we going to say? We get there. I don't think we're going to say anything. We're going to be there in the silence of an eternally beautiful being. God himself. And that's why the hymn writers talk about it, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Eternity. When you've defined eternity, you have then learned to define existence. When you move next to the dimension of morality, then you move to the dimension of essence. Eternity helps you define existence in the biblical worldview. Morality helps you define essence. But here's what I want to say to you at this point. The difference between moral reasoning that is horizontal and reasoning in morality that is based on vertical and spiritually given dictates, there's a world of a difference between the two. There's a world of a difference. I've just finished my latest book, which will be released in January, which is called Why Jesus Rediscovering His Truth in an Age of Mass-Marketed Spirituality. 
Uh, I know that's a tough title. <laughs> I had suggested a simpler one. I'd called it From Oprah to Chopra, but uh, <laughs> the publishers didn't go for it. So, so we went to it. We went with Why Jesus and this long subtitle that I have to think of every time. And one of these days, I'm sure I'm going to stand up there and forget it. But you know, I combed the, the, the hinterland from Greek philosophy to pantheistic philosophy to Buddhist worldviews to Zen worldviews. Uh, and you, you examine all of these and bring it into the modern, postmodern mindset. And you take the vehicle of mass communication and see what these spiritualist thinkers have to say. The new word now is, I am spiritually minded. You don't have to have any, any doctrine behind it. It's all spirituality. And if you breathe properly and sit quietly for some time and just stare into the inside, or if you would mutter some words that will be uh, uh, transcendent in their intimation and give you some nasal sounds to boot. <laughs> you get all of this into your head and still it. You know what? I have scores and scores and scores of friends in India who've tried this stuff. Tried it. Just about five, six weeks ago, I was in India speaking to Bollywood film stars. This is the third time they've invited me to talk to them on a search for meaning. They've lived with all this stuff. It's left them empty. Oh yeah, it's important to breathe properly. And yeah, I'll even go so far as to say, take a few minutes every day to sit quietly and think. Think on the Word of God. Meditate on his truths. Meditate on the beauty of his creation. I'm not de debunking that. But if they drive you into yourself to make you think you are the definer of what is ultimately good and what is ultimately evil, that is not postmodern spirituality. That goes right back to the Garden of Eden. In the day that they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they redefined good and evil, became gods to themselves. That's, what it, that's when it all happened. You see, moral reasoning, think about it. Moral reasoning, if it is only self-reflective and no transcendent notion, do you give the same privilege to your neighbor? That you just want to reflect it on your own definitions? Somebody said to me, what's wrong with evolutionary ethics? I said, whose evolutionary ethics? Who has evolved more than the other? We think humanism has just one imperative. It doesn't. It simply doesn't. Allow me to give you a cruel illustration of this to make my point. Some years ago, I was taking off from a country I'll leave unnamed. The plane was heading on to one stop where I was getting off, then it was going on to Hanoi. A woman was sitting next to me from Holland. And we got into a conversation. We were both very careful about disclosing what we did. And we and suddenly realized we both actually were deeply committed in our faith. And I said to her, what brought you here? She said, I work in the rescue of children from the sex trafficking industry. I work for a Holland NGO. And I was here. I come here regularly. I said, is it a big problem here? She said, yes. I said, were you successful? She said, Ravi. Last night, I went into an area of this city that's called Snake Alley, where men come at the end of their day's work, and they're given a concoction of snake's blood and hard liquor. And they just gulp it down, it ravages the brain. And then they ask for whatever it is they have fancied that they have come there for. She said, I rescued an 18-month-old baby girl from the arms of a man who was plundering and raping her. 18 months. I remember turning away from her at that point, literally thinking I was going to be sick to my stomach. She was all teared up. Now, you know, a man's brain may be ravaged and ask for something that strikes you not just of lunacy, but of ultimate cruelty. 
What about the men and women who are peddling that stuff? What about the government officials that allow such a business to thrive? And I remember saying to a young student once who denied there were moral absolutes at Oxford when I gave him this illustration. I said, what do you think? I gave him two illustrations, this and another. He was like this, along with some others standing, he just with a stove, rubbed the carpet a bit, and he looked at me and he said, you know what? I wouldn't have liked what happened there, but I can't honestly say to you, I would have to call it immoral. Yeah, he's right. It's not immoral because morality has purely horizontal definitions and you can make your own morality but it could be the most cruel, heinous act in the eyes of God, who says, if you harm even one of these little ones, it's better for you to have a millstone hung round about your neck. See, morality sounds good, but there's no point of reference because there's no absolute to refer to. What do you do in a world in which there are no absolutes? How do you you know, I woke up this, the, the day I arrived here, I don't know, what, what's today, Saturday? I think we arrived here on Friday, Thursday? I, don't know, I, I, I just wake up and I look at my itinerary and he picks me up and I go where I'm supposed to go. <laughs> and when I woke up in the morning, I looked at my watch and I looked at the hotel desk and there was a one hour difference. I said, I thought I corrected mine to Arizona time. Their time must be wrong. I have two blackberries, one for my family, one for my work. I looked at both of them, one was right with the night table clock, one was right with my watch. <laughs> it's still there, I can prove it to you afterwards. I won't tell you which T-Mobile or AT&T blew that one, but one of them blew it. <laughs> and so I phoned the front desk. You have to have a point of reference. You have to have a point of reference. When you come to a red light, you stop. At least in America, we do. In India, we think it's Christmas and keep moving. <laughs> you stop. And you look out of the window and you see another car moving on the next lane. You're not sure if he's moving or you're moving, but the light is still red. What do you do? Press harder on the brake. And after you've pressed harder on the brake, you're still not sure if he's moving or you're moving. What do you do? You look out of the window to a building or a tree or something that doesn't move to measure yourself by that. What on earth would happen if the building and the tree started moving too? <laughs> That's what relativism means. Relativism means there's no point of reference. And relativism cannot be true. Somebody said absolutely and he's right. Do you know why? If I say all truth, listen very carefully, I know you didn't come to work hard tonight, but think about it. If I make the statement all truth is relative, that statement either includes itself or excludes itself. If it includes itself, that means that statement is also relative, which means it's not always true. If it excludes itself, then it's positing an absolute while denying that absolutes actually exist. So when you say all truth is relative, you either include it or exclude it, and either way, you have decimated it. It's a self-defeating proposition. Classic case why relativism cannot be true. The absoluteness of God's moral law is based on one word. You know what that word is? Sacred. Holy. Your life is sacred. Your whole, your, 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 Relationships are sacred, your time is sacred, your property is sacred, your word is sacred, your family is sacred, and so is your neighbors. You desacralize life, you end up with the mess that America is in now. We do not know how to define when life actually becomes life. We do not know what marriage means. We do not know what sexuality means, but we call this postmodern, as if we've arrived. We cannot define the most basic things of life because we do not know how to define morality. Eternity, you define existence. Morality, you define essence. 
Thirdly and quickly, accountability. What does accountability mean? Accountability actually means you are accountable beyond any human eye. You are accountable beyond any human eye. That is the most scary thing in life. I've spent more than half of my life in hotels. You know, my original business was going to the hotel business. I didn't realize I was going to be a guest rather than serving people. <laughs> it's true. I was once going into the hotel business, became a, was in the banqueting management, moving up towards management, and then God laid his hand on me, called me into this. I still spend my time in hotels, but for a completely different, for a completely different reason. And I, I've told Kryn when we first, when he first traveled with me, and I've had those who've traveled with me for years, I've always said to them, one of two things will happen to you. You'll either become one of the laziest persons on the face of the earth, or you will develop such incredible disciplines that you'll be a much better human being for it, because you will have to learn how to invest your time. So there are a few principles I practice in my life when I'm on the road. A few principles I've, I've, I've abided by, I've, I've, I've tried my best to play by those rules, and the reason is because I know, ultimately, I'm accountable to God. The doctrine of omniscience, that he observes all things, is one of the most fearsome doctrines to take to heart. But accountability is something we don't find anymore today. Look at all, uh, there's some parts of the world where I go and I ask them for a receipt, they will tell me, well, if I give you a receipt, then I'll have to charge you the tax as well. The implication being, they live most of the time without giving receipts and without paying their taxes, and those countries just plummet down into all kinds of dishonor and debauched cheating of the system. You see it happening again and again. It was a professor from Johns Hopkins University, one time professor at Harvard, one time professor at Yale. His name was Hobart Maurer. He was one time president of the American Psychological Association, committed suicide at the age of 82. He wrote in the American Psychologist, he was an atheist, but he wrote this article and he said he got more resistance and more hostility from his readers when he wrote this paragraph. Listen to what he says. He says, for say he is, he died at the age of 75 in 1982. He says this, for several decades we psychologists have looked upon the whole matter of sin and moral accountability as a great incubus and we've acclaimed our liberation from sin as epoch making. Do you hear what he said? When we liberated ourselves from the notion of sin, we considered it epoch making. We've arrived. Exactly the notion that people like Dawkins and all now celebrate. But listen to what this psychologist who was an atheist said. But at length I have discovered that to be free in this sense is to also have the excuse of being sick rather than being sinful. And it is now courting the danger of becoming lost. This danger is, I believe, betokened by the widespread interest in existentialism which we are presently witnessing in becoming amoral, ethically neutral and free. We have cut the very roots of our being, lost our deeper sense of selfhood and identity, and with neurotics themselves now find ourselves asking, who am I? What is my deepest destiny? What does living really mean? And then he quotes the Anna Russell folk song, psychiatric folk song. At three I had a feeling of ambivalence toward my brothers, and so it follows naturally I poisoned all my lovers. But now I'm happy I have learned the lesson this has taught, that everything I do that's wrong is someone else's fault. No accountability, none. One of the great researches that I did in writing my book, Can Man Live Without God, which was the earliest one I wrote, was to go to Jerusalem and visit Yad Vashem Museum, the Holocaust Museum. And I'd done a lot of research on Adolf Eichmann's life, what took a man from where he was to what he became. You know, Eichmann was tracked down in some little town in Argentina where he's working for a motor car factory. Unknown to him, the Israeli Mossad had tracked him down. If you've read the book, The House on Garibaldi Street, you know the story, and the movie came out too. They watched him from a distance. He would get off from a bus, walk around with his briefcase, look around, make sure nobody was watching, unawares from a distance. They were watching him with high-tech equipment. He'd unlock his gate, walk up before he unlocked his door, look over his shoulder, 
A little boy would greet him and slam the door shut. They watched him for day after day after day on this ill-fated day for him. The Mossad near the bus as he was walking back felled him, plunged a needle into him and knocked him unconscious in a cloak and dagger operation, flew him out of Argentina, incredible uh, precision with which they'd done, brought him into Jerusalem, brought him for trial. After about 20 years, the man who was involved in it, Peter Malkin, broke his silence. He said, I don't want to say anything, but my days are coming to an end. I just want to tell, my, tell the people one conversation I had with Eichen, Eichmann. He said, we were on a train while I was bringing him back, and the most startling thing to me was he looked like an ordinary human being. I couldn't believe all that he'd orchestrated for the death of, death of tens of thousands. He said, so one day I shut the door in his little compartment, and I sat next to him, and I said, Mr. Eichmann, I watched you every day come home, open the door, and greet a little boy. Who was that boy? He said, he was my son. He said, how old is he? He said, he's eight. He said, he's the exact age as my nephew that you killed. You killed my nephew who was eight. He said, Mr. Reitman, can you tell me what's the difference between your eight-year-old boy and my eight-year-old nephew? He said, Eichmann just paused and looked at him, stared at him, and said, my son is not Jewish. Malkin said he walked out of there and he sobbed uncontrollably. He had nothing left to say to a man who had no sense of accountability to God of any sort. And Hannah Arendt ends her book on Meichmann by saying it was the ultimate trivialization of evil. The ultimate trivialization of evil. Eternity, redefining existence, morality, essence, accountability, conscience, and lastly, the dimension of charity, beneficence, the dimension of charity, the supremacy of love. It is this beautiful thing that the Bible tells us about God, that God so loved the world. God so loved the world. The entire notion of the Son of Man coming to seek and save that which was lost is a God driven by love, agape, placing value on you and on me. Do you know, if you have no value, neither do your questions? Why do we even value our questions? because we assume that our life has some essential worth and therefore valuable. And as I look at these four dimensions of eternity, morality, accountability, charity, existence, essence, conscience, beneficence, those are the parameters within which I make my choices. Will it have eternity's blessing and eternal values? Is it more than just a horizontal definition of my moral reasoning? Is it based on the absolute unchanging person of God? Am I accountable for what I am doing here? Can I garb this with the genuineness of love and tell the person, even though I disagree with you, I can honestly say to you, I love you. You know, think of it this way. I'll close with this, that language can be very mystifying, very mystifying. We use words so loosely. Sometimes we use a word in the first sentence and then in the fourth sentence, and nobody says, does he mean something different, the fourth sentence to the first? No, we call that a univocal usage of language. If I say to you, God loves you, and then I say to you, I love you, you pretty much take that epithet love and put it into the context of what it is I'm saying to you. You don't start pouring over your mind and saying, was there any difference in the word there? No, you take it and keep moving on in your thought. But then there are some times where the same word does not do justice because the context brings something deeper. If you ask me, Ravi, are you a good tennis player? And I have the audacity to say to you, yes. And then you happen to be sitting next to a man in, in a plane and you say, what's your name? And you say, well, my name is uh, uh, Roger Federer. And he, 
You say, what's your name? He says, Roger Federer. He said, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a tennis player. And you say to him, are you a good tennis player? And he says, yeah, I'm good. The biggest blunder you'll make is to say, you ought to meet a friend of mine, Ravi Zacharias. You both ought to give me a tennis player. I can't even see what he hits, leave alone chase it back. <laughs> same word, different context. That's what you call an equivocation. Univocal, same meaning, equivocal, same word, different meaning. How then do we talk about God? What's the point talking equivocally if we don't know what it means? What's the point talking univocally when we know it doesn't mean every, the same thing for an infinite being and a finite being? So we borrow a third usage which we call analogical. By analogy, we take that which can be legitimately inferred from one usage onto the other usage. And so when I say to you, I love you, and then I say God loves you too, please understand the difference. When I love you and you refuse to love me, I hurt because I have lost something. When you, I say to you, God loves you and you refuse to love God, God hurts too. God hurts not because he has lost something, God hurts because you have lost something. That's the purity of his love in the value that he places upon you. And if you ask anybody what goodness means, they'll tell you to desire a thing for its own sake. Oscar Wilde, before he died, in his 40s, had plundered many lives. I wrote a book on an imaginary conversation between Jesus and Oscar Wilde called Sense and Sensuality. Wilde was in his room with his lover, Robbie Ross, Wilde was dying. And he looked at Robbie Ross, he said, Robbie, I have a question for you. Did you love any one of those little boys for their own sake? For a hedonist to start wondering what goodness means? He said, did you ever love one of those boys for their own sake, Robbie? And he says, no. He says, you know what, Robbie? Neither did I. Bring me a minister. Only Christ is big enough now to heal this heart of mine. Eternity has a way of reaching down to the final moments of life. Morality and accountability will meet you there as well. And ultimately, what you will need desperately is the understanding of charity, God's love for you, and your return of love for him. And in this world of so many worldviews, I say to people I disagree with, I will disagree with you, but I will never be disagreeable with you. Because if love is lost, then God is lost, and I don't want to lose God in our conversation. That's the way the Christian worldview functions. We stand beside people with whom we do not agree, but we learn to live and let live and celebrate the possibility of truth in the marketplace of ideas, because ultimately God alone is the truth and he is the ultimate judge. This is the paradigm on which you base life's choices. Eternity, morality, accountability, and charity. Those are the foundations that God has given to you and me. And my time is gone. I don't know when it went, but it's gone. Time flies. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>
All right. All right. Do you have a question? Please come out to the microphone. And uh, I've heard a lot of insufficient answers, but very seldom an insufficient question. And you can line up. We'll move from left to right. And uh, after 30 minutes, if you'll give me the privilege of calling it quits, we'll take it from there. Yes, sir. Dr. Zacharias, I have a close family member that has been living with many New Age beliefs for a number of years based on monistic pantheism and put into practice through energy healing. They refuse to acknowledge the objective nature of truth and claim they don't mind living with contradictory beliefs as long as those beliefs work for them. What is the best way to share the gospel with a person that claims they are content with contradictions? Very, very good question, very fair question. And um, I've uh, seen that more often than you could ever believe. And of course, I was born and raised in a country where it's very common to have that view. And then if you add to that the other imperatives that follow sometimes, it involves your family also in the same tradition, so on, you're not willing to repudiate the faith of your fathers or whatever. For a person to say, I know it is not coherent, and I'm willing to live with incoherence, is actually saying they don't care about reason and meaning anymore. If reason and meaning are pointless, reasoning in a meaningful way with that person may also become a pointless exercise. But a person like that sooner or later is awakened into reality by something that will happen. I would say to you the most important thing you can do to them is not preach to them, but live your message and show what a life of coherence actually looks like. Give them an opportunity to hear the words of Christ, to listen to messages or read books. I used to leave books for my father all the time, not knowing, not him not knowing that I was leaving them on the table so that he would read it when I was not there. And you do things like that. You give them CDs, you give them tapes, take them to meetings. There was a great movie in which um, Kevin Klein played the lead role, and it's called The Emperor's Club. It's a story of students in a Shakespearean school where one guy gets in by his father's power as a senator. He is not qualified to get in. You have to be highly qualified to get in, but he gets in, and he cheats his way through class every time. And on the last day in the final exam, they've got about four students on the platform where they're going to be put to an oral test of Shakespearean knowledge. And he's made it to the final four. And the teacher knows he's cheated all along, but he doesn't know how to pin it on him. And so the teacher's in the middle asking questions, and these four have to go quickly and answer it. And the guy's about to lose, but he has a backup plan. He cheats, he gets the right answer, and wins it. And the teacher, Kevin Klein, just looks at him, and they lock eyes, and he knows he's cheated, but doesn't know what to do. Let's it go. Many years go by, this fellow's now grown up. He's the head of a country club in a big financial empire. So he gets in touch with the teacher. He says, I know that you think I've cheated all my way through, and you couldn't pin it on me. He said, I want to prove it to you that I can still win without cheating. Find the other three and bring them to my country club. I'll host it. So they track the three down. They've not done that well. This boy is a big tycoon. The auditorium is packed. Klein is in the middle as a teacher, and these fellows in their middle years now, the questions are being thrown. This guy's on the verge of losing, and he has a backup plan to cheat once again. And he cheats, and he wins. Klein doesn't know what to do. He goes back to his room, picks up his briefcase, and he stops in the men's room on, before he goes. And he's put his briefcase on one of the counters there. And the man walks in, and he looks at the teacher, and he says, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? What's, what's wrong with what I did? So what? What difference does it make? What's the difference? Tell me what's the difference. The other three have lost out. I'm a big tycoon. I've got my success story. What difference does it make? And the teacher is just looking at him and looking at him, not saying anything. All of a sudden, there's a sound of a toilet flushing. None of them knew there was somebody else in one of the cubicles. And the door opens, and the little boy walks out. He's this man's son. 
and he comes and stands in front of his father and looks at his dad and the lips quiver and the tears run down the face and he turns and walks away. Klein picks up his briefcase and says, what's the difference? Sooner or later, incoherence will come back to haunt everybody, either in this generation or the next, and they'll find out that incoherence does make a difference. And God will bring that moment in the individual life. You live a life of demonstration. Keep praying for them. Show them you understand from whence they come. And the one thing you can tell them is this. You will have everything you have in the peace of your soul already, plus more. When you find Christ, you will find the source of all peace and the source of all truth. Give him a chance to be the king and leader and the shepherd of your life and soul. But don't force it down. At the right time, they'll know it makes a difference. I have seen so many come to Christ from my own family and my own homeland. In fact, give me 30 seconds more. My brother-in-law, Sundar Krishnan, highest ranking student during his days, I took him to the first Youth for Christ meeting after I came to know the Lord. We were just friends at that time, teens. He came to know the Lord that day. Ultimately, fell in love with my sister, married her. He was working as the top safety expert for the Atomic Energy of Canada, gave that up, and is now a pastor in a large church in Toronto, a brilliant expositor. We are the closest of friends. He was my closest buddy growing up. His parents, Orthodox Hindus, Orthodox to the bone. On his deathbed, his father, who used to ask questions of me in the silence when we talk in a room, he'd make sure his wife didn't come and hear him asking those questions. She was very devoted to the temple. All this went on. On the day that he struck cancer and was lying in a bed in Toronto, it was on Canadian Thanksgiving, he called his family around them and he said, you know, I want to tell you something. All my life I have just wanted one thing, and that's the truth. And now as I'm dying, I'm discovering it now. I wished I'd discovered it earlier. I want to tell all of you I have found the truth. Do you know what it is, he said? Friends from all of the, te from the temple were standing around the bed in this Toronto bed. And he looked at them and said, I have found the truth today. It is in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I hope you too will follow him and find that truth in him. His children, grandchildren, and all of the friends utterly stunned with it. Two weeks ago, we were in Toronto. My colleague will tell you, a 65-year-old Hindu woman drove from Ottawa, Orthodox Hindu, came to see me at the back with her son and her husband had the privilege of seeing her come to Jesus Christ in that room, the tears running down her face. And her son wrote to me and said, she wrote to me and she phoned me and said, son, this is the first time in 65 years I have slept well through a night. I'm at peace with God in finding Christ. It'll come. And just pray, live, answer questions. Don't ram it down the throat. And it'll happen. Okay. So. <clears throat> Sir. Robbie, I asked this question um, on behalf of my 40-year-old son. He says, Dad, I was raised in a Christian family, but what if I were raised in another country, or even in this country, under a, a family of a different religion? Can you tell me that all those millions of people raised in those situations are condemned to hell? He said, Dad, I can't believe that. I need help with that answer, Robbie. Very good question again, and let me answer it in two ways. I very seldom answer a question for anybody like that without asking them a few questions first myself. And if I were sitting across the table from your 40-year-old son, I would say to them, I understand it, you know. I was not raised in a Christian home. In fact, I was living as a total anti-theist all of my teenage years. I had no interest. My ancestors were orthodox Hindu priests of the highest caste of the Hindu priesthood. So I would say to him, if a person is born in a very poor family. Would you ask him to try and go and make a living or would you tell him you were raised poor? I think you should be content to be poor. Just live that way. 
If a person is born in a home where he's taught to hate, murder, and kill, would you want to change him, or would you tell him, go ahead and hate, murder, and kill? That's what your father taught you to do. Why don't you live that way? That philosophy makes no room for truth. It makes no room for the reformer. Reformers come into society because they see wrong. They see abuses. They see misjudgments. Reformers see people being exploited and want to see that change. So that which is normative cannot become that which is an ought, the way to be. That which is ought must become normative. So the two things I would say to him is this. Does truth matter? Is truth exclusive or is truth all-inclusive? If you have found Jesus Christ to be the way, the truth, and the life, trust him. He will help you deal with the world that is raised differently and help you make a difference and a change in their lives. Then I would say this to him. Don't you think that the judge of all the earth will do that which is right? If you, being an evil person like I am, know how to make such a laudatory statement about what is right and what is wrong, you think God is more impoverished than we are and is going to do something less good than we are going to do? Why don't you trust the judge of all the earth to do that which is right? You follow him and he will help you write the lives that are born in different worldviews and leave eternal judgment to him. Thank God it's not up to you or to me. Okay, leave that. Hi, Hi Ravi. Hi. Um, in uh, trying to keep the idea of context, I want to ask you a question about future text. Of course, and, the question on? Pardon me? Uh, the, the question is... Context, uh, to try to raise a question on. I didn't get the last word. Well, uh, on future text. And uh, the question is uh, under the category of world influence. And a uh, hundred years from now, would you speculate for us on what the world is going to say about the contribution and influence of the lives of some of the people that are really making an impact today. Some of the names that came to mind would be um, President Obama, uh, uh, um, um, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, Stephen Jobs, John MacArthur, Ravi Zacharias, <laughs> or maybe our next president. You know, one of my professors used to say, prophecy is very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> and so, uh, <laughs> you know what? I was speaking once to the Atlanta Braves baseball team. They have kept me humble for many years. I live in Atlanta. <laughs> and before I spoke, they had a guest testimony forget who he was, quite a prominent man. He's authored a book. And he looked across the room and he said to the people, how many of you can name your grandfather? And room hands went up. He said, how many of you can name your great grandfather? And some of them paused a moment and then a, he said, how many of you know where your great grandfather is buried? With each question, with each generation, the hands were getting less and less. He said, what I want to tell you men is, within three generations, you could be a forgotten person. What kind of legacy are you leading? And one of the baseball players there was a devout Christian man. He put his hand up. He said, you know what? I really don't care whether three generations from now anybody remembers me or not, so long as my children now know that I love Jesus Christ with all my heart, and I pass that trust on to them. It was brilliant what he said. I'm sure he didn't mean it with that bravado with which he said it, you know, I really don't care type thing. Yes, you do. But generations from now, most of these men will be, or women will be left as icons of something. They will make a difference. I'll tell you why because they are changing lives now. Who in turn will be, become different people 
and make a difference in someone else's life, and that chain effect ultimately continues. I would connect you to two men in the Old Testament. Prior to the two men, I look at three. I look at um, Solomon, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam. Solomon, we see the untamed passions of a gifted man. Rehoboam, we saw wanton power in a weak man. Jeroboam, we saw the unteachable temperament of a privileged man. Untamed passions of a gifted man, wanton power in a weak man, and the unteachable temperament of a privileged man. They divided the country in two and forever changed the nation of Israel. Forever. Long after that comes a man by the name of Manasseh who repudiated the faith of his father Hezekiah and ultimately ended up with child sacrifice and offering children into the arms of the idols. If you go to Jerusalem today, you'll see the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom took its name from Manasseh's day because it literally means the place of hell. And what would happen at night as children would be offered to the idols and their screams and their shrill voices and an ambered color sky with the flames, people thought this is what Gehenna must be like. Till this day, it's called the Valley of Hinnom. And way up, you can see the Mount of Offense where Solomon kept his harem. But shortly after that came Josiah. At the age of eight, he began to take the reins. As a teenager, he began to seek after God. At the age of 22, he began to cleanse Jerusalem. Age 24, as he was cleansing the temple, they found the Book of the Law and read it out to the people and brought the greatest revival then that they had ever experienced. He gave them back the Word of God taught them how to worship, and moved the nation in a completely different, de different direction. Every generation has to be reached at that time by somebody. And the fact of the matter is if we don't reach them, somebody else will. And if any one of you is a young man or woman today, take a look at Josiah's life and see how a young man like that changed history. You can as well as a teen or in your 20s. What legacy we will leave, I don't know. When I, the reason I write, to be honest with you, and not trying to be funny or lighthearted, the reason I write is because I want to leave some thoughts far beyond my three score years and 10, so that somebody someday may pick up a book and his or her life may be transformed. So live for the values of eternity that if the world is still around 100 years from now, how you lived and what you did and said would make a difference. Never underestimate the power of an individual because ultimately it is an individual who changes history. And I believe that's the kind of individual America is waiting for and I pray it won't be long before that person comes on the scene. Okay, I'm going to see him. Thank you. We'll take just these three. Yeah. We'll, we'll take just these three and then we'll call it a quit. So. No, go ahead, go ahead. I thought that three is a sacred number, but we'll make it four here, yeah. <laughs> Since I had four points, so we'll keep it at that. Here we are. Hi, um, I have a question like, how can I make sure it's God that's working in my life rather than a decision I made that I think is right? How can I make sure God is working in my life and yeah, make and sure that the decision that I make is right? It was right? right, not like a fixation of your imagination. Okay. How old are you? Fifteen. Fifteen, wow. Once upon a time. Yeah. I'm glad you're asking the question at this stage, and I commend you for it. Um, God works through the agency of people. God works through the intermediariness of circumstances. God provides opportunities that come your way and voices that will either affirm or bring concern to you on the decisions that you make. The most important advice I could give to you as a 15-year-old, the most important advice I could give to you, and please give me your name as well. I, I urge you to carefully begin every day on your knees before God. If you start that every day, and I will bring your name to mind, and I will pray for you over the next two to three days, and just ask the Lord, to speak to you. What I suggest to you is when you begin your day with God, you will find that you are entering the day first with His voice. 
that is important for you to navigate through the decisions by reading his word and hearing from him. Sometimes there'll be minor issues, sometimes there'll be major issues. On the minor issues, you borrow from the word of God, you, you, know, you know which way he will lead you in right and wrong. On the major issues, talk to those whom you trust and respect. Get their counsel. Have two or three people like that in your life. I have five of them in my life, whom I write to regularly and get their counsel on things. Take their counsel because what you're looking for ultimately is your calling. Where is he going to use you? What has he hardwired you for? How is he preparing you? Get their counsel, get their advice. And when you make the decision based on your inner prompting and the advice of others, you'll find context and opportunities will come your way. And when you make an honest mistake, God's not the kind of person to cut you down at your knees. He will take the threads of your life and weave it into a beautiful design. I want two things to say to you, and then I'll close with that. I've written a book called The Grand Weaver. I would urge you to pick up that book because it deals with about seven, eight things, how your choices matter, your calling matters, your worship matters, your morality matters, your uh, relationships matter, all of these things, and how they come together in a beautiful thread. It's like a sari woven in India, where the father holds the threads together, the son moves the shuttle right to left, you and I can do what the son does, but only the father has the mind to hold the correct threads to bring the perfect pattern. He is holding the threads of your life. You respond to his nudge, and he will bring you to the design for which he has made you. My daughter Naomi one day said to me, you know, Dad, I've made so many mistakes, but I think God in a beautiful way has had a GPS system in my life. <laughs> and he tells me, you turn, left turn, make a correction and go back to where I want you. When you read the word and you have the right relationships, you will find God's GPS system will bring you into that place of his choosing. Don't listen to voices that turn you away from him. He is your guide and your leader. And I believe with your reading, you will be at the place he wants you to be. Keep it up. God bless you. God bless you. <clears throat> My question is simply this, I don't know if it's necessarily simple, but is Mormonism the same as Christianity and why or why not? Yes. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, are you aware that I spoke at the Mormon Tabernacle a few years ago? Did you know that? Okay, yeah. Boy, did I ever take some heat for that. Uh, they sent three one apostle and one professor and one other man came to my office several years ago and they asked me if I would come and speak in the Mormon tabernacle. And I was stunned, you know. I go to places where I feel they need the message the most, so I do yeah, listen earnestly. So I said, why? Why are you asking me? They said, we believe that you'll have a message for us. I said, has any evangelical ever spoken there? They said, 104 years ago, Dale Moody. I said, oh, wow. If he spoke there, I could probably say, okay. So I said, um, <laughs> I said, two conditions. I get to speak, pick the subject. I get to bring the music. So they said, what will your subject be? I said, the exclusivity and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. He said, we'd have to ask the head apostle on that one, but they said it. And they said, music? I said, I'd like to bring Michael Card with me. So um, I said, they, they, they said, okay. So I phoned Michael Card. He said, I'll drop everything I'm doing and I'm going to come. And Michael Card sang, were you there, Stacy? Yes, yeah, Stacy used to be on our staff. Then she went the way of all flesh, got married, and we're trying to kidnap her and get her back to Atlanta now. <laughs> Her mother's been heavily involved in putting all of this together, by the way. We love her out there and miss her so much. But we was at this Mormon tabernacle, and uh, he sang he, a song that he wrote from Peter's encounter with Cornelius. The words were, I'm not supposed to be here. You talk about 7,000 people listening to a song, I'm not supposed to be here. And he's talking about the gospel. 
And I, if you want to listen to that message that I delivered, we still have it, and we get a lot of Mormon people writing in for it. I compromise nothing on the message. I even address them, uh, the, the uniqueness of the Trinity in there and the exclusivity and the completeness of the work of Christ. And I spoke, I think, at Brigham Young and one of the universities did open forums there and so on. Just about a month ago, the number three apostle flew back to Atlanta and they're talking to me about coming back to the universities and doing open forums. So the first thing I say to you is, I took a lot of heat for that, I took a lot of flack, and some of the radio programs are really going after me. That's all right, at this stage in my life, I have to do what I believe God is calling me to do. If I can take the message to hostile arenas in India and Pakistan and other places, so why am I not gonna take it to places that disagree with me? It's the, uh, I'm not just going to people who agree with me, I go to people who disagree with me even more than, than, than that. And uh, it took a lot of flack because Walter Martin's family had asked me to edit after he passed away, the book, The Kingdom of the Cult. So my name is writ large on the top of that book. And of course, Mormonism is one of the chapters in there. But they knew I would be respectful, but I would not be compromising. But here's what I say to you. Classical historic Mormonism has to answer this question. When the Christian uses the word cult, Christian, not generally speaking, when the Christian uses the word cult, a cult is generally defined as that which claims to be rooted in historic Christianity, but has deviated or abandoned the finished work of Christ or compromised on his person. That's the definition, okay? So in strict Christian terms, yes, Christ was not sufficient, Today, if you talk to an average Mormon around the table, he says, no, I, I, I follow Jesus Christ. And then you bring all the other doctrines that I've added on, and some of them get very uncomfortable with what it is, the Adam-God doctrine, the celestial marriage, the doctrine and the covenants, the pearl of great price, and uh, all of these other additions that were brought in there. I think that it is critical we understand that, the, that Jesus said we are complete in him. And when you add or detract, you can give yourself whatever name you want, but you're impugning the completed work of Christ on the cross. Okay, so there are other titles that one can give to those faiths, but it is not historic Christianity at that point. Now, I think your question goes deeper, and I want to be very careful, and I may be hit out here badly. Does one vote for a candidate who belongs, say, to a faith other than the Christian faith. Everyone has to vote according to their conscience and what God is prompting them to do because it's a very privileged role that we are given in this nation. My view of the philosophy of history and politics is this. When you're choosing between leaders, none of whom will give you the groundswell of the Christian faith on which their life is built, which may not guarantee that they may be the best leader either, you know, but if that's not there, you have to go for a person who will help a nation provide the best moral soil on which the freedom to believe and disbelieve can actually function. It is on a moral soil that the freedom to believe actually works best and truth can ultimately triumph. If you have an immoral soil created, then the truth is evicted and you're not even given to the opportunity of voicing your ideas in the marketplace and in the public setting and in the arena. The Christian faith ought to have a voice in the marketplace. It ought to have a voice in the academy. It ought to have a voice in politics. It ought to have a voice in business. And any leader that'll create the moral soil to make it possible for us to continue to pro proclaim that, that's the kind of leader we may have to ultimately work, no matter what tag they put on them on the outside, if you're choosing between those for whom the Christ is not supreme in salvation, you have to choose one who will give you the best moral soil in order to allow you to live for Christ and live out your faith. That's the implication of the answer that I have given to you. Okay. Hi. So my question is in regards to kind of keeping with the beat of accountability and maybe you could shed some light on how are the state of our country 
or even the world, how much of that has to do with us as a body not standing up? Or would it be more of like the adversary or the devil or the prince of the power of the air being able to infiltrate the world? The lack of the church standing firm or maybe because of that, that there's more of availability for him to have a stronghold, whether it be in the media or politics? I, I mean, you really, you're, you're living in very, very scary times. You know, uh, somebody said youth is what only the young have, but only the old know how to use. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tragic reality. Uh, I wouldn't want to be, frankly, um, halo or no halo, I wouldn't want to be young again. I just uh, don't think I could handle all the rigors and strains of this high-tech culture in which we live. I'm too much of a relational person. Uh, I don't like living in front of a screen. Uh, I don't like to live with buttons and people whom I don't even know signing up as friends. I'm not sure what all of this means <laughs> anymore. You know, you can't, uh, that's, that's not for me. And now for some people it's okay, it, for, for me it's not, not so. And then the ability to penetrate into lives through uh, distortions. The whole pornographic industry is devastating homes, devastating young men, destroying young boys, and it's going to reap its toll in marriages. It's, it's a havoc that is being wreaked. So uh, we are living in some very difficult times, but it's here to stay, we can't fight it. It's gonna be only getting more and more complicated all the time. It's the prince of the air in many ways, uh, both literally and figuratively. As far as accountability, my formula is this. I have worked hard in my life to try to apply certain principles to my own life, but I have begged God to give me the patience for others. Not everybody will always fall in line with those same values and those same uh, commitments. You know, we have about 120 people working in our ministry, about 10 countries, and we are a group of apologists covering the globe. And I just tell my, uh, our, the culture of our corporation is built on three ideas. Honor God, love your staff, and respect your donor. By respect our donor, the donor I mean respect the gift they have given to you and don't treat it as something you can use at your whim. It is something they have entrusted you with, okay? Honor God, love your staff, and respect the donor. I tell my colleagues who are apologists, two things. If you don't have humility, you don't belong here. Because this thing is too heady. It's too heady. It'll destroy you. You have to find the bridge between the head and the heart, and you have to be a humble person. If you don't have humility, you don't belong in this. And the second thing I say to them is, never answer a question, answer a questioner. You're not just dealing with a question. A person has a reason for answer, asking a question. Answer them, not just the question. It's not an abstract thing. So I meet many people who have stumbled, blown it big time. I mentioned that issue in my book, Has Christianity Failed You? And they don't come back to church anymore because every time they come, they're reminded of what a big blunder they have made in something that is said, and they keep it haunts them. We have to be quite aggressive in dealing with sin in our own life, but be patient in dealing with it in somebody else's life and allow the Lord the time that it sometimes takes to correct the person. Our society is changing before our eyes. The best thing you can do is honor God in your own life, but be patient with those who are stumbling their way through at the right moment, they will intersect with God and the load will fall off and he will give them the map to the celestial city uh, and they will follow the directions then. So that's the best I can say to you in this time. Okay, we take the last one. <clears throat> Hi, um, I go to a Catholic school and what I've picked up from what I've heard about their beliefs is that they believe that those who commit suicide go directly to hell. What can you tell me about that? <clears throat> you know, this question has so many ramifications other than that. It goes into things like uh, uh, assisted, you know, suicide type thing where the uh, machines are pulled off or living wills and all these things actually now are coming into play 
the more machines we have and the more science grows, the more complex these decisions become and we are making more decisions of more rapid nature, at a more rapid nature or more, rapid, more dramatic inclination, implications. Let me just say this to you. I wish I had an absolute answer to give to you. I just say this, I wouldn't want to meet the Lord after I have taken my life. And the reason is, in Genesis 9-6, <clears throat> murder is called the ultimate attack upon the image of God. That's what murder is. You have violated the image of God. So if I violate the image of God in someone else, or I violate it in myself, it is the ultimate act of lack of faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So I would say I wouldn't want to meet him on those terms. I will also say this, that I cannot stand as a judge and tell the parent of an 18 or a 19 year old where life has been wasted like that, that that's the end and that that person is held on. That's not my prerogative in life. I would have to leave God as that judge and leave God to work for the peace of a family that has had to live through it. I would never want, I tried that once and I so, <clears throat> it took me years to even talk about it. I never talked about it to my parents afterwards. My wife spoke to my mother <clears throat> and my father and said, it is so embarrassing to Ravi to even discuss it. It's easier for me to discuss it from a platform than it is to talk one-on-one -on -one across the table. The fact that I tried to take my life is a devastating thought to me. The only consolation I have is that I didn't know Christ at that time. <clears throat> now that I know him, I will never ever violate the image of God that he's given to me. And I just pray that in pain or in struggle or whatever, in Romans 14, it tells you <clears throat> about eating food, about one day being more sacred to one than another. It gives you all of these things. <clears throat> and it tells you this, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What it really means is, if you violate a conviction that God has placed in your heart clearly, it's a sinful thing to do. So I would say <clears throat> what Francis Schaeffer says about the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. If you're ignoring the sovereignty, he says, that's what I will preach to you at that time. If you're ignoring responsibility, that's what I would preach to you at this time. If anybody is toying with the idea of taking their life, that's what I would say to them. Don't even think about it. It's the most sacred gift that God has given to you. Don't use your freedom to violate your freedom. The eternal destinies are in the hands of God, but the moment is for us to choose and select. Let us not violate what God has given to us as a sacred gift. It is a, it is a privilege that is entrusted. Trust him through the wildest twists and turns when you finally meet with him, you'll find he sustained you the greatest in your darkest night of the soul. George VI was dying of cancer and he spoke to the world <clears throat> and he said this, I said to the man at the gate of the year, <clears throat> I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may walk safely into the unknown. And he said to me, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. Life is too precious. Don't squander it. Go out into the darkness. Put your hand into the hand of God. It shall be to you better than the light and safer than the known. The greatest triumphs are those who have survived the greatest darkness. In love's service, the wounded soldiers will serve best. So don't think of hurting your life. He will carry you through. That's what I would tell the young person. Eternity is in his hands, and I want to, wouldn't want to risk it on that kind of ambiguity, okay? God bless you. <clears throat> Let me, <clears throat> can, I, can I go back and add one footnote to the previous question? And I think it's important I say this because these things are recorded. In, <laughs> in uh, theological terms and Christian terms, what we define a cult is the way I have given it to you. A departure from the historic person and the work of Christ has been deemed cultic if it still lays claim to the historic work but has departed from it. But to use it in a general sense, in a general community, in a general audience is not a wise way to do it. 
you use that in a setting of theological debate and dialogue and discussion. When the word is tossed around like that in a public setting, because of all the issues we had with people like Jim Jones and others, it brings baggage with the term that makes it much more than what a mere theological discussion would be. So that's a term we leave for the classroom, not for a public arena, because it says much more than what I think one is intending to say with a statement like that. We need to be wise and be mindful of the implications of a, of a loosely used word. It's a very technical word reserved for a theological discussion around a table or a lecture hall. With that in mind, we shall go back and uh, I shall go and look at the mountains and uh, you can continue to do what you're doing. My brother, I don't know, Tyler or Les, which of you are there, Tyler? Thanks, by the way, for having me. It's been great and God bless you. <clears throat> Oh, I'm going to do some signing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you.